It's happening. Breaking news. TikTok sues U.S. government saying the TikTok ban violates First Amendment. And baby, does it? TikTok is suing the United States government in an effort to stop enforcement of a bill passed last month that seeks to force the app's Chinese owner to sell the app or it will be banned. So the lawsuit was filed on Tuesday and the Protecting Americans from Foreign Adversary Controlled Applications Act violates constitutional protections of free of speech. And that is correct. They snuck that shit in real quick because they couldn't get it past the House the last time they put it up. We all know Biden was expecting this to happen after he signed this bill April 24th. I know they did not give TikTok a, any chance to defend themselves. TikTok further claims that the law violates the right to due process under the Fifth Amendment. Sure does. And it is unconstitutional. This is a legislative act declaring a party guilty of a crime and imposing a punishment without a trial. Because, baby, we didn't get a chance to speak. Nobody got a chance to speak. It also says that they didn't give ByteDance enough time to even fix the problem that they quote unquote says that was there, which we all know wasn't. We got more problems. That's an interesting point, though, right? Ron, because the thing yeah. is, it's like there's there hasn't been no trial for this, right? Well, and and also, you know, she brings up the other way they're selling this, other than just relying on you know the xenophobia of people, is they're saying, well, we're technically not banning TikTok. We're just saying they need to sell it. They need to sell it to a different company. They can't have it. But what that actually takes, like, like something of that scale, even having a potential buyer. That's just a ridiculous ask. And they know how ridiculous that ask is. Like, like it, it, it'd be like, it, it'd be like if I, if you said to me like, Hey Ron, I really want to, I'd love to have you on my show, but I can only do it if you give me a million dollars. And I'm like, I feel like you're not letting me on your show, which you don't like, uh, like yeah. no, I'm not trying. <laughs> it's just, if you don't give me a million dollars, you're banned from my show. What Welcome to the channel. Ron Placone, it's good to have you back again. Good to see you again, buddy. It's been a minute. Hope yeah, you're well. yeah. It's, how long has it been, man? It feels like a feels almost like a family reunion. Yeah, it's <laughs> been a while. I mean, I, I was most active in the space when I was like working on some of those uh, some of those net neutrality campaigns. Which, by the way, we did win that one. The FCC reinstated net neutrality. You gotta. I know it's it's so bleak out there that whenever we do get some wins, I, I feel like it's important we mention them because it helps prevent complete hopelessness. So that was a win. Um, and uh, and yeah, I, other than that, I mean, I've just been I've, I've been pretty, uh, pretty occupied with the movie and whatnot, which I'm real excited for you to see. I know you're I know you're a cinephile, so. I hope you enjoy my movie, uh, and and if you don't, I hope you'll spare my feelings. <laughs> yeah, you, you 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 made it sound like something like kind of dirty. I'm a cinephile, like like I'm a thespian. Like, oh my gosh! <laughs> oh, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> just the way my brain works. But one of the things that you actually talked about was yeah, net neutrality. That's something that I think a lot of people. Um, don't necessarily uh well i shouldn't say a lot of people don't invest their time in i feel like a lot of people don't have the time to invest their time into yeah. because yeah. a lot of people especially people who are watching right now they're at work they have they have their kids they may be taking care of their parents they may be taking care of their siblings they may be disabled themselves they may be just trying to hang on for dear life poor life uh so a lot of times they don't have the bandwidth to focus on these things, that's what people like you and me are here for. It's a wonderful pun, so, by the way. You said bandwidth. Oh, <laughs> I, I didn't. I just, I didn't realize, but yeah, so. Wow, okay. The way my brain works, man. See, see what happens when you come around? You're a genius. <laughs> you make me a genius. Um, but one of the things is that a lot of times people don't have the wherewithal to really focus on these things. Yeah. And so I think it's really important that a lot of people pay more attention to the issues that you bring up, especially when in regards to net neutrality, privacy and security, things like that. And so uh, one of the things in, in reality that we just found out was about the recent TikTok ban that just happened. Uh, that was actually, eh, dare I say, snuck into that bill that was um, 
that was uh, a, a, a bill to pay for Taiwan, um, Israel, and Ukraine. Uh, so it, it's just, it's that. And then I saw this video on TikTok as well that I think is deeply important for us to take a look at. Um, and I didn't know this, and I just wanted to chime in with you just to see what your thoughts are. Let me see. Okay. Just making sure I have this ready. I should have had it ready earlier. My apologies, but Did my computer just freeze? Oh, oh no. Okay. You're a little choppy. I mean, you're coming through, but you're you're a little choppy. Yeah, that used to be my stage name back in the day when I was a uh, little choppy. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Give it up for a little choppy. You're a tall guy, though. Give it up for a little choppy. Okay. <laughs> are you not tall? How tall are you? Uh, I'm five ten. I'm okay. not like so. You're I'm not average. I'm yeah, that, that's not quite little choppy noteworthy. That wouldn't get that wouldn't earn you a little nickname, I don't think. Five ten. No, but if I was short, if I was short and sweet, then I might even be sweet and low. Um, but yeah. So let's go into is this yeah okay. So I want to share this with you because I think this is important. It talks about the ACP. And oh yeah. Yeah, this is important too. And I want to combine this along with the TikTok ban. So let's go. Sure. Well, yeah. It's tomorrow. Tomorrow the ACP goes away. You know what that is? The Affordable Connectivity Program, the government subsidy that provided just a measly $30 a month that was still enough to keep 23 million households connected to the internet. And it's about to go away tomorrow after being in place now for years. We're about to just disconnect anywhere from 65 million to 80 million Americans, depending on what numbers you're using. It's roughly about that many people. 65 to 80 million fucking people are about to have to figure out all at once how they're going to pay for the internet. And according to the FCC's last survey, roughly three fourths of those people are going to just stop using the internet in their home altogether. And I want to make sure we're very clear about something. This is going to kill people. This will kill people. The FCC has said that broadband access in your home is one of only a few super determinants of health because it allows people to look up symptoms and know whether or not it's time to go to the doctor. It allows people to get telehealth visits. It allows people to check their prescriptions, change their prescriptions, get refills on those prescriptions. It lets people access community support networks. It lets people access remote therapy, any number of good things for us. And we're about to make sure that if you want to access that information, you got to pay full price. And at a time when everybody knows that cost of living is top of everyone's mind, to strip this resource away, this $30 a month subsidy, tiny, but so significant, is nothing short of a moral failing of the country. Because I want you all to keep in mind, this is a bipartisan piece of legislation that has bicameral support in the House and the Senate. Republicans, Democrats, independents all want this passed. It is because of a, ch a few chuckle fucks in Congress, not forcing a vote on this, that this is not getting refunded. We, there's a bill right now, which is the Extend ACP Act, which would give $7 billion immediately back to the program. It could fund it through the rest of this year. $14 billion would fund it, I think, through the rest of this year and into next year for a little while too. We could fund this in perpetuity. This is a fucking rounding error on the U.S. defense budget that would keep our economy competitive. It would keep our citizens connected. It would keep them informed. It would allow them to participate in the global economy. Do they really want to keep us informed, Ron? <laughs> I guess it depends on who you're watching. But, um, but yeah, I mean, this person summed up the ACP uh, perfectly. And, and for anyone who's not in the know, because it's, it's not a super um, – it's not a super talked about issue, but the ACP is the Affordable Connectivity uh, uh, Act that – goes back to 2021 it provides as that person said that's all spot on it provides a 30 dollars subsidy to 23 million households um and the affordable connectivity program officially expired uh at the end of this month 
with the kind of funds that were in, you know, like like kind of the reserve funds will be fully depleted towards the middle of May. So honestly, in, in a couple weeks, there is that bill to extend it. They've just been sitting on it. There are other, you know, uh, pushes out there to kind of rally Congress to actually, yes, force the vote and and make them vote on this. Um, there's also some other programs out there that are intended to kind of pick up the slack um, to make sure people don't lose internet. But it, it's such an easy fix. I mean, they can extend this thing with no problem. It's really not costing them that much. Um, I don't want to get too far in the weeds here, although you, you probably knew if the topic's digital rights, I'm going to hardcore geek out. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you knew that before you invited me. But um, this connects to another flagship issue of mine, which is public broadband. Um, you know, I've spoken about it uh, with RBN uh, a number of times. And, and for anyone not in the know, public broadband, aka municipal broadband, is just making the internet a utility in your life where instead of some private cable company that's uh, you know these companies are among the most hated companies in the freaking world um instead of that being the source of your internet your internet is run by your city or municipality there's places in the united states that already have this the places that have it experience the best internet at a reasonable price because internet infrastructure I'm not going to sit here and say it's completely simple. It's not, but it's not rocket science either. So you really don't need a ton of resources to maintain decent internet infrastructure. You just have to give a poop and you have to be not solely based on profit, which is how the big cable companies operate. So municipal broadband uh, is very, very successful and c directly connecting it to this issue all of the uh, public broadband institutions that are out there, Utopia out in Utah, Chattanooga's public broadband, which is some of the best internet in the world at a price that's cheaper than what most people pay. Um, they were able to completely subsidize low income housing or, or, or low income uh, citizens of their municipalities. So yeah. they didn't even have to worry about the ACP because they were able to completely subsidize via the networks themselves. So that's another advantage of public broadband. It's a public utility and not just some big cable uh, operative. So they can kind of do what they want as far as financing, is, is, as far as putting it back into the public. So they're able to, I mean, they provide different levels of service depending on what you want. So if you you know, have a lot of means, or maybe you run a home-based business and you want to pay, you know, top shelf dollar for like the, the fastest fiber imaginable. Uh, although even just their basic packages are pretty freaking fast. I pay a business cost here in Los Angeles and the quality of internet I get would probably be equivalent to their just regular service for, for, for a muni broadband network. Um, yeah. so so they were able to just completely subsidize it, whereas, you know, other people that don't have public broadband or municipal broadband, they're relying on this program, which, again, it's a good program because it kept a bunch of people online and the Internet is clearly a utility in our lives. The frustrating part about it is if we took all the resources that they gave to cable, because keep like cable companies got most of this money. The government was giving this money to cable companies. If all that money instead was invested into public broadband, we'd be better off and we wouldn't have to be worried about anything extending now. So so, so that's sort of the frustrating element of it. And, and it's just another, just yet another example of, of how, you know, corporations are just ruining our ability to have nice things. But yeah. but in the short term, like, yeah, we, we got to extend this thing because it's not like you can just snap your fingers and a bunch of public broadband projects will be done. Had yeah. they started that in 2021, we would have been a lot better off. But, you know, that wasn't the case. So we got to extend this thing. But uh, but yeah, so yeah. so that's frustrating. Yeah. I mean, I was just thinking about, and just really quick, uh, you know, an idea of, you know, what if we were to try to get, you know, for those of us in ballot initiative states, try to get a citizen ballot initiative to make it so that all, you know, uh, internet broadband companies are public, are publicly owned, I'm not publicly owned, but uh, municipally owned either by city or counties, or if we had state owned, but it, it would like mandate that, or at least make like a competitor, a competitor 
for the broadband companies and then you know or something like that it sounds you know maybe i'm just shooting at the dark here but you know something like that will probably if citizen ballot initiative putting that forth i think that a lot of people especially in my state in florida we don't want to pay all these high prices to yeah. these companies. I mean, I I'd rather it go to like if like say Orlando had a broadband uh, company, I would rather pay my money to go to Orlando because it's going to be cheaper and then I'm going to have better service anyway. Totally. I mean, and and yeah, you're not off the mark with like um, ballot initiatives being a big part of this. Uh, I would say. If you went the route of, oh, it has to be publicly owned and no one else can be here, that might be a longer climb just because big cable is going to sue you for that. And they have very, very powerful attorneys. Uh, I think the more kind of quicker ballot initiative would just be to build your own public broadband network, which can certainly be done via ballot initiative. In my state in California... There was actually a, a broadband bill that financed a ton of public broadband throughout the, sca- the state uh, that was signed into law. It's you know one of the few things Gavin Newsom did that didn't completely tick me off. <laughs> He's done a lot of other things that have ticked me off, but that wasn't one of them. That was a good thing. Um, but uh, basically what it did was it just made a skeleton of broadband. And then it's up to cities and municipalities to basically get their extension claw onto that skeleton to give everyone internet. So we're a couple steps closer to getting extensive public broadband here in California. We don't have as much red tape as some other states in comparison. Um, So yeah, those kind of things like do, those are effective ways to to make it happen. And, and you can start literally in your neighborhood. Like any, I mean, there's there's a town of 7,000 in Massachusetts that did this. They just decided they were being underserved by the big cable companies. They got together and were like, screw it. We're just going to build our own internet. They did. And now they have this crazy fast internet. They're a town of 7,000 wow. people. So if they can do it, I, I think anyone can 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 it, it's not a one size fits all scenario and mm-hmm. you know there's definitely different hurdles depending on are you in a place with a lot of mountains or are you in a, like whatever but um True. but it can be done and, and there's tons of contractors there all throughout the country that kind of specialize in this sort of thing and you know i hate to say I, i'm not I'm, I'm not gonna i am one of these people i think that every hardship that there is an opportunity component of it. And Mm -hmm. with as terrible as the pandemic is, um, the one kind of lemonade out of lemon situation was people really realize how much the internet is a utility in our lives. And they realize how underserved they are by big cable. I mean, we found out when kids weren't able to physically go to school, we found out that, hey, here in Los Angeles, one in every three children doesn't have internet sufficient enough for a Zoom call. That's freaking unacceptable, especially when they were in a situation where they couldn't go to school otherwise because it was all over Zoom. So it really brought the digital divide front and center. And just in a few short years, this space has gone from you know, sort of an obscure talking point in the uh, indie media space, you know, via, you know, people like me and a a couple of nonprofits to being this really booming space where most cities have, you know, nonprofits and other entities dedicated to digital equity. Um, So, so that's sort of a new thing. And, and, you know, for someone like me, who's just sort of been a, uh, policy geek about this stuff for literally 20 years now it's it's really exciting to see yeah definitely and in line with that you know all you know speaking of which you know all things internet as we see just a couple of weeks ago there was a appropriations bill that was to appropriate funds of course to ukraine israel and taiwan really you know just to keep uh, U.S. hegemony uh, alive and well within the regions, you know, combating against China, Russia, uh, and Iran uh, for the sake of basically keeping their claws over there. And there was a bill, part of that bill was actually a, a, a 
an act to essentially ban TikTok after one year. Yeah. And yeah. so I just want to share this as well because they're really saying the quiet part out loud. Uh, this is out of Rolling Stone. It says lawmakers admit they want to ban TikTok over pro-Palestinian content. It says a potential ban looms over the platform. Some are admitting that they hope that the mass demise will help kill pro-Palestinian Palestinian sentiments online. Uh, just your first uh, initial thoughts about the uh, sneaking in this ban along with this bill to fund uh, you know, these three different regions uh, to keep the United States grips basically on the world. So, yeah. So first of all, um, you mentioned a lot of things that are really key factors and everything going on here. Uh, first and foremost, the uh, discussion that that article references, because I, I could tell via the photo, is a discussion between Mitt Romney and Secretary Blinken. I've watched mm -hmm. it. Um, I recommend people watch it. You can find the clip where they talk specifically about TikTok. Um, mm -hmm. I don't recommend watching the full hour unless you like torture. Because uh, <laughs> listen, listening to those, it, it's a it's a really creepy thing. Actually, I, I talked about it uh, on Status Quo. Like it's really creepy. Like it it starts out with this weird elevator music, and then Mitt Romney comes in and Mitt Romney always sounds like he's about to lead a cult to like some mass suicide. Like that's just like, he's like, all right. And now you drink the Kool-Aid. Like he's just weird. <laughs> but, um, but they talk about TikTok. It is very chilling. They openly admit that they're having problems controlling the war narrative and they mm -hmm. complain about quote unquote images. What do they mean by that? Read between the lines. They mean they don't like the fact that people can see what is physically going on there. They don't yeah. like they don't they're not mad about the cat videos. They're not mad about the Chinese government. They're mad that people can see what's happening in Gaza. And they're like, that's he literally um, I mean, Mitt Romney literally referred to Israel's skills at doing, quote, PR. He literally says that. And they keep saying the word narrative over and over again. So they're admitting that it's all about controlling the corporate pro-war narrative and things like yeah. TikTok threaten that. And, you know, so they're going after TikTok. So, so that's the big part of this. There's three things that are going on here that are really the, the key components here. One mm -hmm. is the censorship element, which we just covered. The other element, and, and I feel like this element is getting overlooked, but I think it's still very important to note. There's the financial component to this. So one of the big leaders of this bill and the bill prior, which was the Restrict Act, which we're going to get to that in a second because that answers your question about the sneaking it in part. But, yeah. um, but one of the key pushers of this bill is Mark Warner. Mark Warner is one of the most wealthy members in the Senate and in the House. His portfolio of assets is obscene, even for an elected official. Like, this guy's portfolio of assets, I mean, it might even dwarf Pelosi, to tell you the truth. I, 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 can't, I can't say that definitively, but, I mean, you could look at the open secrets. It's pretty ridiculous, even for, you know, an, an elected official. And yeah. what's one of the things he has a lot of money in? Well, he has a lot of money in domestic uh, software, domestic apps, and that type of development, which means mm -hmm. what helps his bottom line? Well, if you demonize anything foreign. So mm -hmm. he has a big financial incentive to scare people about something like TikTok. And mm -hmm. this all goes back to the Restrict Act. Now, the Restrict Act, which I talked about on your show, uh, and I think I talked about it with, I think maybe Rome, but I talked about the Restrict Act a, a couple times on some RBN things. But um, mm -hmm. the Restrict Act was how this was all birthed. And the Restrict Act went far beyond just banning TikTok. That was just one of the things it did. Uh, it was basically the Patriot Act Part 2. Uh, the Restrict yeah. Act was going to crack down on what you could and couldn't do on the internet. It was going to demonize... Uh, it, there was a clause in there that would have allowed the president, uh, whoever's president, to dictate what foreign content you could see. So there would have been a thing where basically any given president could say, oh, that's something... That's a video someone made in Gaza. You can't see that. Um, mm -hmm. And there was something else in there uh, that 
would make having a VPN illegal. I mean, I, I use a yeah. VPN. I know a lot of people do. So the Restrict Act, I mean, there was just so many poison pills in that thing. The whole thing was a poison pill. Yeah. They even called it the Restrict Act. They didn't even try to sugarcoat it. Um, yeah. So because of gross public, you know, like, like because the public was just grossly against this thing and it was so apparent, they weren't able to get it through. So what they're trying to do instead is they're just trying to tack on bits and pieces of it. And they're not going to stop at TikTok. You know, they're going to try to get all that stuff through. And there's a big financial incentive for people like Mark Warner because they have domestic investments. Um, yeah. The other big thing going on here is, you know, the way they're trying to sell this. They're trying to sell it via, oh, your, 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 your privacy and this and that and the Chinese government. In reality, all of the uh, domestic information of TikTok users in the United States, it is housed in, in the United States and it's housed in Singapore. None of it, I repeat, none of it is actually in China. So they're just straight yeah. up not telling you the truth. Whether you think yeah. it's okay or not okay aside, they're just straight up not giving you accurate information. That is just straight up not true. So mm -hmm. in the TikTok hearing, which I covered live, it was a bunch of xenophobic nonsense. Uh, the yeah, official from TikTok, he straight up said, hey, we're going to make a deal. All the information stays in the U.S. You have full control over it. We don't touch it. It's not even in China, guys. But, hey, we're going to give it all to you, and that's our deal. Does that sound good? And that Republican from Texas just said a bunch of – I mean, it was really – disgusting the way he treated that person it was just straight up yeah. rude um and and rejected that and said this is america we're freedom it, it, it was gross um so really this entire thing is just some nationalist xenophobic nonsense and and they're trying to use that as a shield to take away more of your rights online that's really all yeah. they're trying to do and this is such a hyper nationalistic country uh, that they're getting away with it. There's a lot of people who, you know, I, I, I don't think would really be okay with anything they're trying to do that are kind of falling for it. And they're like, well, the Chinese government, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, look, I'm not saying the check. Whoa. Oh, sorry about that. No, it's okay. There's an emergency alert going on. Oh, no that's what it's like. No action is needed on my part. Uh. I have my phone on do not disturb. But uh, but when it's an emergency alert, I guess it goes off anyway. Uh, yeah, no, they, actually, told they told me they told me I don't have to do anything. Oh, it's just a test. It's a straight up test. A test? Yeah. I didn't get one. Yeah. Well, I don't know Weird. if they do everywhere all at once. Uh, yeah, but I guess I guess in the Los Angeles area they're doing it. But um, but yeah. So so that's really what this is all about. I mean, this is just about the financial incentives of people like Mark Warner. And just, you know, like they don't like the fact that people are seeing what's really going on. They can't control the war narrative that that yeah. is easily. So and if they really were concerned about our privacy, again, all the all the BS. Oh, someone else got one of SoCal. I, I saw in the chat. Someone else got a SoCal notification. Um, but uh, if they were really concerned about our privacy, Jay, they would just pass a data privacy bill. But they don't do that. Why don't they do that? Because that would hurt the pocketbooks of the domestic people who lobby them so hard. The Mark Zuckerbergs of the world. The Elon Musks of the world. That's why they don't do that. This isn't yeah. about your privacy. It never was about your privacy. And by the way, another thing that hearing revealed, look, I'm not saying there aren't privacy concerns around TikTok. Of course there are. But you know what's even worse? Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. So if you have a problem with TikTok, but not any of those... You're being propagandized, my friend, because the investigation revealed that Facebook and Instagram, Meta, uh, Twitter, they're even worse with our privacy and information than TikTok is. They do more nefarious things. They openly admit they sell our data. We are the product. They know that. That's what made Mark yeah. Zuckerberg very rich. Yeah. So they're mm -hmm. actually worse than TikTok, the way they use the algorithms yeah. and stuff. Essentially, you can say that TikTok is actually safer than these yep. American sites. Yeah, technically it is. It, it, yeah. it technically is. So, so it's all the way they're selling this is just a bunch of xenophobic nonsense. And what it comes down to is they don't want you to see anti-war content. They don't want you to be able to engage with, um, you know, foreign entities in the software space because that'll hurt the bottom lines of the Mark Warners. So it's all about just censorship and money. 
Yeah, exactly. Um, there was uh, a, a video that I also wanted to share that really uh, also sums it up as well. Young lady, and of course, I'm using TikTok on purpose because I think it's really important that, you know, uh, we share videos from TikTok because the thing is, like, even though, uh, and yes, there is a, there's a potential ban, you know, that's, ha that's looming over the next year, but uh, I think it's important that we utilize this app even more now. The reason being is because um, I want there to be more public outrage and outcry so that, because it's more than just TikTok. This is potentially, uh, uh, you know, many different websites and apps that could be swept up along with this that are, and then this can go to different, uh, you know, news organizations as well, that it may not be based in the United States. And that yeah. goes into my next segment um, later when I talked about how Israel just basically banned Al Jazeera. And so, you know, what if the United States starts doing things like that, you know? So, but that's one of the reasons why I also want to continue to share uh, what they're saying on TikTok because, you know, it still needs to be utilized because a lot of people are speaking out. Regular people like you and me are speaking out. Well, you're not regular, but. I'm know. pretty regular. Uh, you, you, you're, you're an exception to the rule. <laughs> All right. I don't know what that means, but. You, you're, you have a talent. Talking. So, you know. You have a talent. Listen, to, the, listen to that yeah. smooth <laughs> voice of yours. Thank you. I, I always you. love your voice, man. I'm 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 envious of your voice. I wish I had the the JB pipes. Oh, thank you, thank you. I I, I wish I had the the, be, the ability to be able to, uh, you know, be a comedian like you as well as it's a, it's a know, decision away. They got they got open mic nights in Orlando. Yeah. <laughs> don't put me on. Don't put me on the spot, Ron. All, all, all your listeners now are going to be like, when are you doing stand-up? Uh-oh. No, 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 no. you wanted no. to do it. That that takes a whole difference. That takes somebody with chutzpah, like you. <laughs> you got chutzpah. Man, I mean, it's just, I mean, sometimes when people say that, they're like, man, I wish I could do stand-up. I'm like, what's stopping you? You know, if I decided tomorrow I wanted to be a carpenter, there's a lot of things that are stopping me like a lot of tools that i just don't know how to use and i would really need to start at the beginning but you know if you're like man i want to do stand up like all right well all that involves is, is just writing something which clearly you know how to do talking into a microphone which clearly you know how to do you're technically doing it right now and just standing in front of people which you can do uh in fact honestly standing is optional you can sit if you need to so you know it's uh nothing's in your way all right well, I'll, I'll, I'll give some thought. So <laughs> <laughs> let's go into this. She breaks it down uh, and packages it with a nice bow for us. It's happening. Breaking news. TikTok sues U.S. government saying potential ban violates First Amendment. And baby, does it? TikTok is suing the United States government in an effort to stop enforcement of a bill passed last month that seeks to force the app's Chinese owner to sell the app or it will be banned. So the lawsuit was filed on Tuesday and the Protecting Americans from Foreign Adversary Controlled Applications Act violates constitutional protections of free of speech. And that is correct. They snuck that shit in real quick because they couldn't get it past the House the last time they put it up. We all know Biden was expecting this to happen after he signed this bill April 24th. I know they did not give TikTok a, any chance to defend themselves. TikTok further claims that the law violates the right to due process under the Fifth Amendment. Sure does. And it is unconstitutional. This is a legislative act declaring a party guilty of a crime and imposing a punishment without a trial. Because, baby, we didn't get a chance to speak. Nobody got a chance to speak. It also says that they didn't give ByteDance enough time to even fix the problem that they quote unquote says that was there, which we all know wasn't. We got more problems. That's an interesting point, though, right? Ron, because the thing yeah. is, it's like there's there hasn't been no trial for this, right? Well, and and also, you know, she brings up the other way they're selling this, other than just relying on you know the xenophobia of people, is they're saying, well, we're technically not banning TikTok, we're just saying they need to sell it. 
They need to sell it to a different company. They can't have it. But what that actually takes, like something of that scale, even having a potential buyer, that's just a ridiculous ask. And they know how ridiculous that ask is. Like, like it, it, it'd be like, it, it'd be like if I, if you said to me, like, "Hey, Ron, I really wanna, I, I'd love to have you on my show, but I can only do it if you give me a million dollars." And I'm like, I feel like you're not letting me on your show, which you don't like. Uh, like, yeah. no, I'm not trying. It's just if you don't give me a million dollars, you're banned from my show. Why? Well, I don't have a million dollars, Jay. I mean, that's like what it's the equivalent of. Asking them to just randomly sell something in that context to a buyer, it, it's just, it's like asking a regular person for some obscene amount of money they don't have or something. Like, like, like it's just ridiculous. Um, so, yeah, that's when she brings that up. That That's a very good point. Yeah. And, and on top of that, you, you're really trying to force the sale of an app that has over just almost shy of 150 million users in the United States. Just to let you guys know, there's about 330 million people in this country, meaning of almost half of the United States uses TikTok. Yeah. Half I mean, of the country. And let's just talk about, just an aside here, how freaking politically tone deaf is it to try to do something like this just months before an election? It's, it's absolutely remarkable. I, I mean, it, there's... I don't know what exactly is going to happen in November. Like, like I think it, it's still so hard to predict because cycles shift like by the hour these days. But and if Biden loses, do not blame leftists because this guy is doing everything he freaking can to beat himself. Uh, although it could be argued, so is the other guy. But uh, wow. I mean, uh, okay, so. Uh... Because I also wanted to touch on that. As far as Joe Biden's concerned, I personally think his goose is cooked. It's just that that's just the way it is. He's he's, you know, died fried and laid to the side. You know, I, I, that's I, how I see it. I think if the election was held today, absolutely. freaking lutely. But yeah. You know, November is a while from now, and 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 it's, I mean, dude, we live in the United States of amnesia. You know, like, like if it was more than forty eight hours ago, you're rolling the dice whether it'll have any effect or not. That's just the reality. I mean, I mean, a lot of the people who vote in this country, they're not like you and me. They're not like consuming a bunch of news all the time, and and they're you know like policy geeks and, and political geeks. Like most people aren't that. Um, so, and I'm not saying they're like dumb or anything like that. I'm not implying that. I'm I'm just no. implying like like they're just gonna. The most prominent cycle is what's gonna be is is gonna dictate the results because in 2020 I thought for sure Trump was gonna win. It was Trump's to lose, and but then he just mishandled so many things up until the last minute. That people were just, they're like, okay, we got to just get this guy out of here. So I, I think it's, but I think if the election were held in May of 2020, Trump for sure would have won. I think if the election were held in September of 2020, Trump for sure would have won. But in those last couple months, things just really shifted. And you had people that, you know, normally didn't vote that were like, we can't, this guy, I, we don't even know what the other guy's deal is, but this guy has got to get out of here. That, that's why, like, in the end, a freaking stale ham sandwich would have beat Donald Trump. <laughs> and, you know, but but it, yeah. it, that wasn't the case. I mean, in September, I was saying Trump's for sure going to win. So now I'm just like, man, with the amount of time that's left, it's impossible to make a prediction. I will say if the election were held today, right now, Trump wins in a landslide likely. But, dude, a lot of stuff could happen until November. Yeah, I mean, this is just to give us some context for what you're saying. Uh, this is out of Real Clear Politics uh, 2024 general election, Trump versus Biden. Um, the RP RCP average has Trump at plus 1.2 points, percentage points. Uh, and this is as of two days ago on the 5th. Um, so, I mean, to be honest with you, 
uh, you know, Trump, you know, at the very least, in my opinion, would eke out a win. Um, it also shows this day in history on May 7th of 2020, Biden was leading Trump by over five points. And then in 2016, Clinton was, you know, beating Trump by six and a half points. So it's, it, you know, it's kind of up in the air right now. I still do think that because, and this is just to go to your point, yes, not as many people are as attuned to uh, politically what's going on as you or I, but I think they're more attuned now than where they were two or three years ago because of apps like TikTok, because so many people, especially a lot of more young people, are more well-informed uh, because they're not getting their information from the corporate media. Now they're getting information from people like you who, you know, gives news from, you know, news from a dude on the beach, right? They give, you know, media, they get it from people like me, RBN, you know, you got Lee Camp, you got the guys over at Gray Zone. You got so many different people that are independent now. So right. I feel like they... I feel like it's still, I feel like there's a, a larger chance of Trump winning versus a equal chance of either. It, does that make any sense? No, man, that, that's totally fair. And, and you know, again, if the election were held right now, I, I completely agree with you. I, I just yeah. feel like in like come November, I mean, there could be, there could be, I mean, also we live in an era of sound bites. I mean, yeah, there's more media out there. More people are engaged. A lot of young people are super engaged. Like, like Gen Z is super plugged in. Um, yeah. But I don't think they're not going to go. I mean, it'll be interesting because I think a lot of Gen Z, they're really put off by Biden, but they're not into Trump, though. Like a lot of them, like, like a lot of them, I, I think they're either going to go third party or they're going to stay home. I mean, and in some ways, it's interesting to see because I, I feel like this generation is is the first generation that at their young age has a much more comprehensive understanding of power. And when I say power, I don't mean like military power. I mean like I mean like building grassroots power. They have a yeah. better understanding. I mean, that's why you see these a 27 year old BLM activist getting elected to the city council. You know, I mean, you're seeing, you know, here in Los Angeles, we had a, a leftist controller who was active with the green party, get, a, get elected controller. Um, a lot of his campaign was run by people who weren't old enough to have a, have a beer at his celebration party. You know what I mean? Um, and that is something that really does give me hope. I, I feel like they have a different, and Look at what's going on. They sure as hell see the importance of a protest. And they sure as hell see the importance of a union. It's young people that were making the Starbucks union efforts happen. It's or, or, or a lot of young people, rather. It wasn't all, but 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 a lot of young people were, were behind that. It's young people on the campuses right now. Um, so I feel like they have a different alignment of what power means, where, where they're sort of like, they're off put by seeing these two, you know, geriatric corporatists, you know, like, like, like fighting to the bottom to get in the White House, um, mm -hmm. which, by the way, it is quite literally a fight to the bottom. Uh, the one thing yeah. I think Trump and Biden have in common, both are going up against the only person they might be able to beat. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's deeply interesting, to say the least. And uh I also want to share um, this as well because um, apps like TikTok are also available in places like Israel, right? Because Israel has TikTok. They use TikTok too. But what they aren't counting on is that there's a lot of Israelis that are now actually going up against basically their own government um they're saying a lot uh this is from uh canthan 2030 says tel aviv protests tonight in the war hostage release no to rafa invasion and netanyahu must go this is another reason why they want to ban apps like tiktok as well
that says B.B. Escobar. So they're comparing Benjamin Netanyahu to Pablo Escobar, who, was, if anybody doesn't know who he was, he was a drug kingpin in uh, Colombia. And so that's who they're comparing B.B. Netanyahu to. That's that's hilarious. Mm hmm. And, and look, they really don't want people. Oh, sorry. Is it playing? No, no, no. Oh. I, I can still play it while you're talking. No, I, I was just going to say, I mean, look, they really don't want people to see this kind of thing because, you know, what's the we all know, like the oldest propaganda tool they use. Hey, if you if you're against the genocide that the Israeli government is committing with the help of the American government, you're anti-Semitic, which, you know, we all know how ridiculous that is. Um, mm -hmm. But that's still what they try to use. So so when you're showing stuff where it's like, no, look, these are Isra Israelis are against what their government is doing, just like Americans are against what their government does. It's not some monolithic thing. You know, yeah. th that's a really, you know, j just lazy smear that you're trying to pull off there. Um, and also, you know, that's been really aided domestically by organizations like Jewish Voices for Peace. You know, yeah. I always like to bring up when people say that, look, I grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. The synagogue in my uh, in my community um, is the synagogue that had that shooting a couple years back. And, you know, my, mm -hmm. my parents, you know, I, I have Jewish people in my family. My parents lost friends in that shooting. Um, mm -hmm. So in that shooting, that was an anti-Semitic action. And if you go to that yeah. synagogue today, you know what you're going to see? You're going to see a sign calling for a ceasefire. Wow. So I'm like, you're going to go up to, you're going to go up to the people at that synagogue, tell them they're anti-Semitic, tell those mm -hmm. Jewish people who had an anti-Semitic shooting where some of them got killed <laughs> that they're anti-Semitic because yep. they want to cease fire. Good luck with that. Guys? Good luck with that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, like for instance, these guys that are basically wearing, you know, Palestinian themed yarmulkes, these Jewish people who are literally supporting Palestine, mm -hmm. you know, so it's like, you know, it, are you guys going to call them anti-Semitic when they are practicing faithfully their religion and also calling for a ceasefire and really showing us what, what Judaism is all about, about peace, community, acceptance and whatnot. And so I think this is the beautiful part, especially about the, the anti-Zionist, anti-imperialist Jewish voices that have been speaking out on this as as well because uh as far as what's been going on in these college campuses i uh, i mean dare i say i can speak for both of us when i say we're we're be, both of us are extremely hopeful absolutely um the other side to it i mean it, it is so freaking inspiring to see these young people and yeah. it does make me so hopeful the other side to it that i think we both would also be in agreement on is oh it's so hard to watch what the cops are doing and just how they're brutalizing these protesters you know i went to indiana university and that is one of the universities that's been making the news a lot they did a walkout demanding that the president resign um and when i was there we protested the iraq war every week and every week at least once a week i was out there on campus protesting the iraq war and mm -hmm. they are protesting today in the same place that I stood uh, some years wow. ago. It's not it's not important to mention a number how many years ago that was, but some I years ago, JP. Um, and, you know, it was really, I mean, to be honest, I got a little emotional because I saw the footage of the cops standing on top of the student union building with guns pointed at these students. And... Yeah. I never saw anything like that. And I could picture, I mean, I remember standing right there. I never looked on top of the student union and saw a, a cop with a gun. You know, that didn't happen during our Iraq war protests. The cops would come and they'd be dicks, sure. But they never stood there with guns pointed at people, you know, the way they did back at the Vietnam protests, which, by the way, this is something eerie. Uh, a member of my family uh, knew and was friends with Alison Krauss. And Allison Krauss is one of the, you know, she was one of the people shot at Kent State. Um, the, this cousin is significantly older than me. Um, but yeah, he went to a dance with her. They were friends. She grew up near where I did. And um, 
I'm going to see him this weekend because one of our one of our family members is getting married in, in Southern California. So I'm going to see him this weekend and it'll be kind of weird just seeing him and, and realizing, yeah, like you remember what it was like for Vietnam. I remember what it was like for Iraq. And here we see this new generation, you know, protesting the wars and the genocide. And in some ways, that's very encouraging that that people will not stop beating the drums for peace. But in yeah. some ways, man, isn't that frustrating that we still got to be out there? You know, that 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 the U.S. is still this imperialist uh, monster, <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so it's uh, th- there's a lot of kind of different emotions going on there that, that I feel like a lot of people can relate to. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, I one of the things uh, that also I think really ushered this uh, student protest was that so many students are locked in. And so for, you know, just like what you were talking about, what Mitt Romney was saying, uh, that it it was really to him, it was like the narrative. And it's like, I asked this uh, to Fiorella Isabel a few weeks back. I would like to get your opinion. Um, Has Israel lost the information war? And if so, how severe do you say that the war is lost. Like, how severe is the loss, in your opinion? I think yes, they have lost the information war. I, I mean, they they they've been playing, and by they, I, I don't mean just Israel. I mean, I mean the entire war machine, the U.S. government, the Israeli government. I mean, they're all in cahoots. Um, I think they've definitely lost the information war because people are siding with. The protesters and and they're demanding ceasefires and and they're seeing through all the propaganda tactics. I mean, you know, I, I know Rome says this a bunch how, how the U.S. is is the most propagandized nation in the world, and uh, I feel like I haven't been to enough countries to to say that that's for sure the case. But what I will say is, uh, the U.S. is by far the most war propagandized nation I've ever been to. And if there is a nation out there more war propagandized than the United States, I don't want to ever go there. So if it does exist, I don't want to ever go there, wherever it is. Um, and I've never been to one anywhere close to as war propagandized as us. Um, you have Western war propaganda elsewhere. It's not like it's just the U.S., but no one has it turned up to 11 the way we do. Yet despite that, you see all this civil unrest against the war. So, yeah, I think they have completely lost the information war. I think history will not smile fondly on, you know, the John Fetterman's uh, of the world in this issue. It's going to smile fondly on the protesters the same way, you know, the same way we reflect back on the Iraq war and the Vietnam war. It's almost like there's a trend where if you're for these wars, you're on the wrong side every time. I don't know. I can't help but notice. (laughs) Can't help but notice. There seems yeah. to be a pretty big consistency where, you know, when, when you go from Vietnam to present, if, if you're for our wars, you're on the wrong side of it. <laughs> Isn't that weird? It's like, duh, like, come on, man. Like, And the funny part is, you know, you, you get people, uh, you get some people who are against the the protests that are going on in college campuses and I'm like, okay, but we protest the Vietnam War on college campuses. We protest the Iraq War on college campuses. And the thing is, like, it seems like each time those college campus protests were happening, they were on the right side of history. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I, I, I'll put it this way. When you have uh, people who are protesting this war, and the other side that's defending the war efforts that are going on, when you have them uh, emitting racist tropes and giving, you know, and and making fun of, you know, black people who are also oh, trying God. to. Did you see that old yeah. Miss stuff? Yeah, yeah. That was and... disgusting. That was it was. So, it, uh, it broke your heart. I mean, especially like we're talking about all the young people. To see those young people doing that was, God. 
Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but God, that that was so hard to see. Yeah, no, I, I mean that that's a really good point because the thing is, is like, I I put it this way: if you are on the side that makes racist tropes towards people, and then you're you're making uh, these racist tropes, if they're on the same side as you. And they're calling themselves condemning you. Now, you may want to rethink. Because the reason why is because there was this young man that uh, went to Old Miss University of Mississippi. He made monkey noises at a black woman. Well, he was just kicked out of his fraternity. I'm not sure if you saw this. Yeah, I did see this actually. Yeah. So it says Phi, Phi Delta Theta announces removal today. Uh, the University of Men. Uh, University of Mississippi in the NAACP called on University of Mississippi to expel Phi Data Theta member JP Staples. He is the young man that was actually uh, he did this um, against this black woman. So he was uh, making monkey noises at a black woman when she was protesting the genocide of Gaza. <laughs> So that's the black woman that they are making monkey noises at, and this is at the University yeah. of Mississippi. Yeah. So if you guys see, I'm not sure if that actually showed, because I don't know my my computer froze for a second. Yeah, it, it's painful to watch. I'm, I'm sure a lot of people have seen it already, but yeah, they, they yeah. were they were making monkey sounds and monkey noises at her. And uh, that was mm -hmm. just so, yeah, that, that was brutal to watch. And, and I guess that guy is a pretty big scumbag. Like he's, he's like a legit Nazi, I think. Right. Like he had, he, he had like some tweets praising Hitler and whatnot. And well, he, he doubled down. Um, and so, uh, you know, and from what I can tell, I think he, put his tweets on protected now because it's getting too much. Yeah, I heard um, he deleted his account. I'm not sure, but yeah, I, I, I saw some of the headlines. They're like, what a gross what a gross way to conduct yourself. And and apparently it runs in his family too. They they kind of did a deep dive on this guy and he comes oh, from went after a, his dad. Yeah, he they, comes from a legacy of racist douchebags. <laughs> yeah. So unfortunately, you know, he, he just ruined his his future, you know, by being that way. And but my point is is that if you have people like that that are on your side when it comes to what's going on in Israel, you might want to rethink. Yeah. You might want to rethink, you know. And so yeah, so I, I think it's really important that we also take that into consideration. Uh, I was watching some war footage or war footage. I was watching some protest footage yesterday and there was this one guy who came up and he was being very loud and belligerent and it wasn't clear like what exactly he was for, but he started dropping, you know, like, like homophobic slurs and racial slurs. They weren't even directed at anyone specific. Like it was, it was unclear what this guy's deal was. But a lot of the protesters are like, we don't really, yeah, we're not co-signing what you're all about. And then finally, you found out, oh, this dude is with, he started praising the cops. He started thanking the cops. So he was he was against the protest. He was, you know, oh, yeah, to your yeah, point, yeah. to your point, <laughs> the guy dropping a bunch of slurs was, you know, against the protesters and for the cops. Surprise, surprise. And, yeah. And it was kind of funny because it's like even the cops were sort of were just like, oh, God, don't acknowledge this, dude. <laughs> <laughs> even the cops are like, even the, even the even the cops, even the cops are like, we don't want to we, we don't really want to give that high five back. <laughs> but uh, but yeah. Oh, geez, man. Yeah. So I, I think that's that's deeply important that we, you know, take into context exactly what's going on. And I'm so happy that the kids are going to be all right. Um, and Ron, just as you know, I went over time. Sorry about that. No, but no it's always fun to talk but, to you. But one of the things I wanted to ask you about is what do you have coming up next? I know you have your film coming up next. 
uh, soon, and I hope that it comes with an overwhelming release uh, and, and notoriety. I, I'm hoping I'm hoping for Avengers in-game numbers. But tell me what you know. What you have coming up? So uh, June eighth is the next screening of my movie. We've been doing events where we're we're doing a short stand-up show, a screening, and then a Q and A after. Uh, June 8th. So yeah, June eighth in Idlewild, California. That's in the Los Angeles area. It's a cool little mountain town. They got a cool indie theater scene. So uh, yeah, anyone in the SoCal area? I know some of you are there because you got the same uh, emergency alert that I did. Uh, if you feel like coming up to Idlewild June eighth, please do. You can get tickets at romplacone.com. It's a show screening and Q and A. Uh, I'm gonna be in England in September. Don't have all the details available yet. But we're going to be doing an event in London on September 21st, Morecambe on September 26th, and Sheffield the 27th and 28th of September. So if you have any listeners over in the UK, I will be in England in September. Um, and then, of course, in the meantime, we're, we're working on just trying to get digital distribution for the film itself. Like usually when you do an indie film, you start doing uh, festivals and some screenings if you're going to do them. I've done a couple screenings, done a couple festivals, still waiting to hear back from a bunch of them. Um, yeah. And then simultaneously, you kind of look for proper distribution to get it distributed everywhere. So soon enough, it will be available everywhere. I know we're only doing screenings in so many places, so not everyone can catch it. Um, but I do some virtual screenings occasionally where I do it over zoom and I just kind of, if you follow me online, I'll announce those. And then you can just, you, it's pretty informal where you just kind of like Venmo me a couple bucks if you're able and I'll send you the link. Um, and if you're not able, but you want to come anyway, just let me know and I'll send you the link anyway. You know, if you can give a few bucks, that's great. But if you can't, it, if you want to see the movie, I want you to see it. So, uh, so yeah, but, but, and soon enough, it'll be available everywhere for everybody. It'll be distributed as many places as possible. And for more information on all that, you can follow me, romplacone.com, at romplacone on Twitter, romplacone on YouTube, romplacone on Substack. I make it easy. Romplacone on all the platforms, and I'm all, I'm on all of them. I'm on TikTok. I'm not very good at it, but I'm on it. Uh, romplacone on Instagram, threads. Blue sky, yeah. Romplicone in the in the uh, that's a lot of platforms in the phone book. I'm I'm still in the yellow pages. It's just Romplicone. I'm the only one. It's just are you in the <laughs> white pages too? I I'll, maybe I don't know. I don't know. Do they they don't print those anymore? I think we just showed our age by talking about the yellow pages. Yeah, right. Yeah, some people are like, "What does that refer to?" Yeah, that, wait, was that was, was that what happened? Pages? That was that was MySpace before MySpace. That that was yeah. the pre aim thing yeah yeah if you want to find out what businesses and where people were you, that's all you got to do is follow, go to there yeah it used yeah. to be a really cool resource actually and anyway yeah for dating ourselves yeah yeah <laughs> and uh so and you're also still doing uh shows on uh on status quo as well right yeah, I occasionally guest host there and and do some programming for them. Uh, you okay. know, when when Jordan uh, wants me to. So yeah, I do some stuff over there, and I have a new podcast as well. At least new since the last time I've been on your show. Uh, it's called oh. One Thousand with Ron Placone. Um, you can get it wherever you get your podcast, and I drop clips online. But the concept is, I'm interviewing one thousand different people who have piqued my interest in some way. So Ooh. I'll be having you on at some point for sure. I'll, I'll definitely, you're, you're on the list. Um, but yeah, I mean, we've had everything. There's been a lot of political guests. Like I've had Jill Stein on the show. I've had, uh, man, who else has done nice. this show? Uh, Corey Doctorow's done it. So there's a lot of tech policy wonks because I'm into that. And then I've interviewed a lot of musicians. Jello Biafra has done the show. I've interviewed other comedians. I've interviewed mental health professionals. Paul Gilmartin was my guest this week. He's a comedian and host of the Mental Illness Happy Hour. So it's a little bit different than Get Your News On With Ron, where instead of me curating news that I think is important, I'm curating people who I find to be very important. Uh, some of them are in the public spotlight. Some of them aren't. They just have really information, really interesting information to share. I did an episode where art with Artsy Marxists where she talked about her art and how she left the United States for Mexico. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, it, it's just a lot of that. It, it's sort of broad, yet specific at the same time because it's just like stuff I find interesting. But if you're if you're into 
lefty politics, punk rock music, indie film, uh, Ren Faire culture. If you're into any and all that stuff, you're going to love this podcast and you're going to love the people I talk. I've talked to a couple of professional, I talked to a professional busker out of Italy. It's a, it, it's a cool show. And 1000 with Ron Placone, wherever you get your podcasts. All right. The Italian stallion, Ron Placone. Thank you so very much for coming on. Thanks for having me. Always, uh, always a pleasure. All right. Take care. I'll talk to you in the interwebs. Bye. Bye, man. Peace. Thank you so very much for watching my channel, and I deeply appreciate it from the top and bottom of my heart. If you wish to support the channel further so I can keep bringing you content that is educational and informative, you can become a patron on patreon.com forward slash jbfon. You can find that link in the pinned comment or in the description below. No matter what you give, you'll be supporting independent media and education that helps make the world better. Thank you so much, and you can watch more of my content here. Forehead kisses, and have a beautiful day.